Hey guys, welcome to my video series where we learn how to EQ everything and today we have drum rooms. Let's do it. Okay, so if you have watched my previous videos in this series or any previous video that I have done, you will know that for me drums live off the overheads and the rooms. I think good room, having a good room in the first place and then being able to mic it up properly is essential to get a good drum sound. And you'll hear that starting from Nirvana, you know, smells like teen spirit, up to any, anything else, it, the drum is always, it's always about the room. And every engineer, every drummer will tell you that it's the room that makes the drum sound and then that compression and the EQ and all of it. Um, so therefore to me it's paramount to get this set up absolutely perfectly. So we have a couple of rooms here. You can see that we have a couple of sets that are in pairs. We have a stereo room and mono room. Here we have two stereo rooms together and then just two stereo rooms for from different kits and we'll see what we can do in terms of EQ. Now generally speaking my approach with rooms is that I want to get a lot of the shells, I want to get a lot of the tone of the kit from the room microphones and so my approach in terms of EQ is going to be different than to overheads. You'll see I'll keep a lot more of the lower mids, I keep a lot more of the low end and you'll see that I actually end up reducing many times the top end quite a bit. Because I also know that I'm going to be blending this in with the overheads. So the overheads give a lot of the attack, a lot of the transients, a lot of the imaging of the kit, and of course a lot of the symbols. So I don't like to compress my symbols too much, but I do love to compress the rooms a lot. And so therefore I want to EQ them also differently, because they serve a different purpose in my book. So let's have a look at the first one. So what we can hear is quite typical. It's not a very good room. It's a kind of a medium recording. Um, the stereo image is okay. There is some space around it. As we can see even here on the analyzer, we have a big boom in the lows. That's also quite typical of room mics. Uh, we don't get too much top end, of course, which is fine because the mics are, of course, further away. And uh, let's see what we can do with this. It sounds to me a little bit dirty. We have a lot of that mid-range that I don't want. So I do want lower mids, but I want them to be still clear. What I also hear is that this one sounds a bit nasal to me. You can hear this excess of 2K, even without the boosting, it's there. So if we reduce that, we get a much more neutral, a much more natural sound. And of course then we have the harshness from the cymbals still that I definitely don't want in the case of the room. But in terms of EQ I think this is as far as I would go. And it's difficult to do only an EQ video when it comes to drum rooms because the compression will change the sound often quite a bit. So in this case what I'm going to do is I'm going to add uh, just a heavy 1176 all in. I'm just going to use the bomber here to do that. Uh, just to see how this actually translates and what happens with the overall tone when we actually compress it to a degree that is probably required in the mix. Okay, so as you can hear, the cymbals came up a bit 
too much maybe and it might work in the context of this mix but in case it doesn't we can cheat and we can use uh, this knob here but I don't want to do that because I want to show you how to EQ it so we can just reduce it with a high shelf and when I reduce when I reduce tops and bottom I want to use a shelf because I want to reduce everything after that frequency. So as you could hear, the compression even brought up a little bit more of that lower mid-range. So I compensated for that by simply cutting more. And now this is the kind of sound that I would be looking for uh, from room microphones. It's nice and pumping. Uh, it has this low end thing going on that will supplement a lot of the tone for the shells, which is what I'm looking for. And it will give a nice ambience also to the entire kit. Um, that is not very intrusive because of course we have reduced the top end which is where the symbols are so it's not going to be unpleasant we're not going to get a splashy crashy kind of bad sound from the symbols uh, just some good punch and good body from the shells you know the snare the toms and the kick let's have a look at the mono room Okay, so it sounds very similar. It's uh, the same kit, it's the same room, it's probably even the same microphone or a similar microphone. So I'm just gonna copy paste. And I'm quite happy with that. Uh, let's see how would they blend. Now, when it comes to mono rooms, I have to be careful in how intrusive they get because one thing I don't want in the center of my mix is excess mud and excess splashiness and any, anything that can cloud up the center of my mix where I want the most clarity, right? Because that's where my vocal is, that's the most important for me. That's where my guitar solos will be or the, the snare, of course, as well. And any kind of lead instrument that ultimately is the essence of the song. It, it's what we are mixing for, what we are mixing around. So um, usually what I do with mono rooms is a secret trick and I'm gonna show you how it works exactly. Um, don't tell anyone because this is quite a unique thing that I do. Um, I'm gonna show you now. It's called the backspace button. So you hit it once, and you hit it again, and problem solved. You don't have any more problems with the mono room. <laughs> now, of course, I don't do this every time, but 90% of the times, I don't have a use for a mono room microphone. Sometimes it can add a bit of thickness to the kick and snare, yes but it tends to cause more problems and it really depends on the genre and the style of the song. In a clear pop setting where I have my drums set up beautifully and I can clearly image where the toms are and the hi-hat and I have this beautiful stereo image going on and the clarity, I don't want the mono room taking away all of this uh, context, all of this beauty that I have worked on. So, okay, sometimes you might keep it. Sometimes it's, uh, it will work if you automate it. You know, you might want to have your verse a little bit narrower and then you switch the balance between the stereo and the mono room and then you have it wider in the chorus, for instance. Yes, it can work, of course, and maybe in uh, some trash metal or old school punk rock song, it will work having a mono room or if you can find the blend of the mono and the stereo room where you don't lose any of the stereo image and you still can retain the clarity, then of course it works. But again, as I said, mono overheads, mono rooms, backspace, backspace, no problems. Let's have a look at the next one. Okay, this is from a recording I did uh, quite a while ago. Um, I remember we were in a large room with brick walls, I think wooden top, slanted, so not very problematic, but we can hear, because I think I used the wrong kind of microphones, I think it was U67s again, uh, that we have a bit too much of that nasal mid-range. So before I do anything, I want to get a more balanced, a more neutral sound out of this.
we also have a lot of symbols here so it's a, a bit bit balanced a bit too heavily in favor of the symbols i would say i'm not getting a lot of the body that i want So, of course, you will never be able to change the character of a recording completely. And as you can hear, uh, no matter what kind of EQing I do and what I do, it still retains the original character, the original uh, tonality. But you can do these little fixes that I have done. You can reduce a little bit of the nasal tone, a bit of the harshness in the upper mids. I reduced again the top end a little bit and uh, I was very surprised I had to boost quite a lot of the lows to get that uh, pumping sound in the bottom. However, this is not a rocky song, so I'm not going for this kind of heavily compressed tone, even though you can get a really nice one if you have a look at that. So you can definitely get it, but uh, this was a more poppy ballad kind of song. So what I would do here is probably using a different compressor altogether just to even it out. And what I would want is more of the ambience, a bit more room, a bit more openness from my kit. So we could use just some normal, so to speak, compressor with more moderate settings. So this kind of setting is not giving me a lot of the pumping from the compression and we get really nice tonality thanks to the EQ tweaks and this would work well if I blend it in with the overheads and the rest of the kit. We get a lot of the shells, we get a bit more of the top as well but in a good way, it's not too splashy, not too trashy. Um, and most importantly, we can open up the chorus really nicely when we blend this in in the chorus. So usually I automate the rooms quite a lot. I have my own ways of doing that in parallel chains and so on, but it's an amazing way to play with the dynamics of the songs while keeping the rest of the kit intact. Let's have a look at the next one. Okay, so here we immediately have the inverse problem. We have a very boomy low end. The microphones were maybe somewhere in the corner. It doesn't sound very even. We have a lot of splash. Uh, and let's see how we get. And let's see what we get from the toms, if there are any. So the problem is that I get a lot of low end from the kick, but virtually nothing from the toms. So this is not a very successful, not a very good recording, unfortunately. But you can see this huge build up actually below 50 hertz. So this is massive and this is going to be a problem. So I'm always reducing this 2K, not only because it's uh, obviously bothering uh, the nasal character, but also because that's where the lead instruments live, especially the vocals, right? So we don't want anything here conflicting with the vocals later on.
Okay, so it's not a bad tone, but it's still a bit uneven because the kick is still very pumping. So let's see what compression does to it. You can even see in the meters here that it's going crazy on every kick hit. So you can compensate for that by applying a low cut here in the side chain, but that is kind of a workaround solution. But let's see how it works. Okay, that's actually really good. Uh, now what I can hear is the kind of 5K harshness from every cymbal, so we definitely want to fix that. Okay, so this is not a bad sound. Depending on what I want, I might reduce the top, I might reduce the highs even more and the upper mids even more, but this is, this is workable. But as you can see, it was mostly fixing, meaning mostly reducing frequencies that were too much. And we were able to achieve a more balanced tone that will blend much better in the context of the whole song. Now let's have a look at the next one. Okay, so we have some of the usual problems here that the kick is almost completely to the right, at least to my ears, and there's also some phasing going on, which I can hear very clearly. So let's have a look at a snare first. So the snare is okay, it is in polarity, it's not quite in phase, so there is a difference between the placement, it wasn't quite even. Normally what I would do is I would separate this uh, stereo audio, audio file into two mono audio tracks and I would align the snare transient so it overlaps perfectly between the left and right. And then also I would have to check the kick, of course. Let's have a look at the kick. And the kick, as we can see, is problematic because it is not only not aligned, but it is also completely out of phase. So I believe this here would be the transient. Uh, so it's a little bit misaligned and almost completely out of phase. And that's exactly what I hear. And yes, this would be quite major surgery that would have to be done here. If I align the snare, I would have to move the top one back a little bit, if I remember correctly. It would be a bit better, but it wouldn't be a complete solution to the problem. And again, this problem becomes amplified once you add compression. Um, and what I definitely don't want is a phasey low end, because we want, especially this was a heavier song, we want a very clear punch, a very clear low end from the kick and the bass, of course. So in this case, I might have to resort to major surgery, which means cutting off everything below 100, maybe even more, just to make sure that I don't have any problems with the low end. Now the kick is still completely in the right and uh, that I can fix by moving the regions but then I end up messing up probably the snare. And what is interesting, I hear the whole thing being heavier on the right, but my meters are telling me that it's actually heavier on the left, it's louder on the left. So that's how much the timing difference is favored towards the right, that the timing difference is telling me, it's suggesting me that things are coming from the right side, even though the volume difference suggests that it comes from the left side. Yeah, I cannot fix this with the, the balance knob, unfortunately. This is, this is a tricky one. And 
I remember actually I remember actually talking to the client and telling him because he also worked with a remote drummer so he wasn't able to supervise supervise a session and I wasn't able to be there uh, and we tried many many things but the drummer wasn't able to find a placement where the problem disappeared or maybe he or maybe he didn't understand what the problem was we tried I think four or five different uh, recordings and test recordings and this was the best one which is a shame because the room and the kit are amazing this is a very good room and the kit is tuned amazingly the playing is very good but unfortunately just by the bad microphone placement this is a, an unsuccessful recording i would say So with compression you can hear that we only get uh, the crashy top end. We don't get any of the nice bottom because there is no nice bottom. I can recover it just so we can have a listen but it doesn't sound pleasant. It is out of phase, the low end is mostly on the right side, it's not really working. In the mix this is just gonna cause a mess and I remember actually not being able to use this track unfortunately. Let's have a look at the same recording, same session, same drum kit, same room, but different placement of the microphones. Okay, completely different story. It's much more balanced, the tone is even better, I would say, and the stereo image is better, the kick and the snare are actually in the center this time. Let's have a look if we have any phasing or polarity issues. So that's a kick. Okay, so as you can see, there's a volume difference, um, but the polarity and the fade is actually pretty spot on. This is usable, this is very good. Snare. The snare is actually perfect. Look, it's completely the same. Same timing, same everything. Very good. There seems to be a slight loudness difference. So we know, of course, that if you have stereo regions on your tracks, then the pan knob actually becomes a balance knob, so it just changes the volume between left and right. It doesn't move it around. So with plus nine, we manage to get the snare nicely in the center. Kick is a little bit off to the right, but it's okay, it's okay. Okay, so let's have a look at what we can do with EQ here. We still get a nice low end punch here, but it's not unpleasant, it's not boomy, it's very good. So I'm just gonna do a low cut below 36-ish. Then, which is very good, we just have the usual problems here now. So there's nothing major to fix apart from the usual things, which is below 2 and 500 somewhere. Okay, so this is now sounding like a really nice balanced drum kit actually. I really like it. It's, um, it's good. It's good. There's nothing majorly wrong here. Let's see what happens when we put compression on it. So even with the sidechain filter completely off, this is now perfect. This is an amazing sound. This is very, very good. Let's have another listen. Now, with the compression, I can hear that the mid-range, the nasal mid-range came up a little bit, so I'm going to be a bit more aggressive on this particular EQ band here.
And of course, because I want my symbols to be nice and even, I don't want them to be too compressed, I will use the overheads to get most of those. And I'm just gonna supplement the whole sound, the whole tone of the drums with the room. And of course, if I want a more aggressive sound, I'll use more of the rooms, I'll use more compression, more par parallel compression. Uh, you can watch my previous videos about how I mix drums to see more of that. But for now, I think this is a really good room tone. Let's have a look at the before and after. And just with and without EQ. So as you can see, without compression, it actually became a bit hollow. It's like I removed too much. I removed too much of the essence of the sound here. So I would have to be a bit less aggressive if I do this EQing without compression. But because I am compressing, it does work actually. So as it's always the case, when you do something after so, it's, so when, as it's always the case, when you do something, you usually have to revisit what you've done before. So in case of the compression, you can see I had to EQ a bit more aggressively. If I was to reduce the compression for whatever reason, then I might have to change these EQ curves a little bit to a bit less aggressive approach. Okay, so this is all about rooms and room EQ and room compression because the two go hand in hand so much that you cannot separate them, unfortunately. So I hope you found this helpful. If you want to learn more, you can do one-on-one -on -one classes with me. My contacts are in the description below. We can do one session, we can do multiple sessions. One session is usually four to five hours long. We basically go until our brains give up and I want to teach you everything, mostly the basics, so you don't need any of the YouTube videos anymore because it's all about a foundation. If you have a foundation and you can do your own problem fixing, you can find your own problems and you can find your own solutions, then that's sorted. That's all what mixing is. It's about finding problems like we did now and then finding a solution, an appropriate solution in a given context. That's all what mixing is really. And then of course you have to sprinkle in a little bit of emotional understanding and emotional manipulation in terms of how you automate and how you present a song to the listener. But that's all about it. So I want to teach you the basics. I want to teach you the foundations and the foundational understanding. So you can do exactly what I did, maybe even better, hopefully even better, without having to watch any more YouTube videos or do or watch any other tutorials. I'm not gonna give you any BS. I'm not gonna try to sell you plugins or presets or any of that nonsense that most other people do. It's just five hours of one session or multiple sessions of straight talk of real facts that you are going to be able to use for yourself. So hit me up if you are interested. And of course, if you like this video, hit like and subscribe and I'll see you in the next one. Until then, happy mixing. Bye bye.